So hi everybody, welcome to the um, last uh, part of this session of the conference. It is my pleasure to introduce the last speaker of the conference, um, Professor George Ray from the University of Maryland. The talk that he is giving today is titled Syntax and Idealized Dispositions. George. Yes, well, this will be a very different kind of talk from the previous two. <laughs> I hope, you know, the scope of the uh, conference is appreciated by everybody. Um, uh, also, you'll see that I have a curious habit of, um, of, of making slides with a lot of indentations, which I believe facilitates reading. If Tell me later if you really find it's irritating and it doesn't help. I'll also highlight, you know, uh, material, you know, uh, to catch your eye appropriately, I hope. Okay, well, here's an outline. I'm going to begin by giving a brief summary of uh, my main foliist or foliism claim uh, that I defended in my, my recent book, Representation of Language. Um, uh, all the scholarly refs uh, will be in the email I sent you. Um, uh, I'm not going to include a lot of them here. Uh, I'll go on then to defend against um, uh, some philosophical critics, uh, the innocuousness of foliism, pointing out that it really isn't you know, such a disturbing thesis as, as it can initially appear. Uh, and I'll also you know, make a concession to, you know, an ecumenical concession to e-languages. Uh, but then I wanna focus on an issue that John Collins and uh, another philosopher of linguistics, uh, Gabe Siegel, have raised against me. Uh, they wondered how if, uh, I don't think that these, uh, 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 words and phonemes are what I call standard linguistic entities are out there in the acoustic stream. How possibly could acoustics exhibit syntax? And if it couldn't, how possibly could anything in the mind represent, represent it? I find that a really interesting objection and uh, that's what I'll be eventually focusing on uh, about, two uh, about a third of the way into the paper. And my solution will be uh, developed in section three where I talk about high, highly idealized SLEs Again, SLE stands for standard linguistic entities like words and phonemes and features. And I'll discuss one option that people have, I think, confusedly appealed to, namely that they're in the mind. <clears throat> and uh, then I'll go on to talk about articulatory idealization and how that um, affects syntactic perception, providing some evidence uh, that there is such a thing as syntactic perception. I'll conclude with my main thesis that uh, perception is, is a kind of imposed, idealized, an imposition of idealized structure. Okay, so that's the plan. Uh, do stop me if I'm talking too quickly, please. I, I do that without knowing. Okay, <clears throat> okay in uh, representation of language, I defended Chomsky and approach to linguistics against a wide variety of philosophical objections, <clears throat> uh, most of which will not concern us today. Um, I'm especially impressed by the Galilean conception that John uh, discussed uh, on the first day of, the, of our conference uh, that brings to linguistics idealizations common to the rest in, in the rest of science. It's a conception I'll try to bring to acoustic phenomena uh, that could be regarded at least ideally as having syntactic properties. But I also draw a further perhaps controversial but I think natural consequence of Chomsky's views, <clears throat> what I call foliism. <clears throat> Normal speech is a folia de, in which, or a n for n speakers, in which speakers and hearers enjoy a stable and innocuous illusion of uttering and hearing tokens of words, phonemes, and other standard linguistic entities, although such tokens are seldom if ever actually produced. As I like to say at this point, I'm not uttering any words right now, and you're not hearing any. It's a marvelous folia de we share. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, by the way, uh, let's be clear, uh, like as in linguistics generally, I won't be concerned with orthographic tokens, uh, which are not part of the language systems in general. Uh, SLEs, I want to stress that SLE, SLEs include, to my mind, instances of phonological features, sometimes called tropes in philosophy, but never mind, uh, uh, which, you know, things like being an instance of a nasal or a, <coughs> or a you know, a verb phrase, which surely appear to be out there along with words and phrases. But I distinguish them from internal representations of features, contrary to much, I'm afraid, very confused linguistic usage. Uh, it's just a constant source of exasperation to me. 
to see this. The word features is used by many, many linguists to, to, uh, to mean the internal representations of properties, right? And it gets very, very confusing, uh, as we'll see, um, um, <clears throat> in, some, in some consequential and deep ways, uh, which I'll discuss in due course. Uh, just for those you know, non-philosophers who may not be familiar with this you know, issue, uh, treating features themselves as internal representations is an instance of what philosophers call a use mention confusion, confusing a mention of the word dog, D-O-G, you know, uh, to refer to the word itself with a use of it to refer to the animal. Or in linguistics, confusing a feature such as plus voice, the actual feature, with an internal representation, quote, plus voice, force, equivalently, you know, whatever's in the brain. Thus, when I say there are few, if any, instances of phonological features, <laughs> which is, I, I believe, <clears throat> I mean in the actual acoustic stream. I don't mean there aren't plenty of representations of them in the brain. We'll return to this issue when we consider below the treacherous claim, features are in the mind, a common expression that linguists use. SLEs are for me uh, what Franz Brentano, a 19th century German philosopher, what he called intentional inexistence. It's a rather inelegant phrase, but you'll see it. It, it really picks out an important you know, area of concern. Okay. These are intentional inexistence are things <laughs> that people represent and think about and take themselves off to perceive, but which they may even know full well do not exist. Nowhere, no how, maybe not even in possible worlds. Standard examples uh, that have been discussed in the literature are Zeus and Santa Claus. <clears throat> uh, the second and there is a mistake. Um, more interesting psychological examples are afforded by illusory figures, such as uh, Kanitsa triangles, <clears throat> uh, you know, where yeah, they're actually the appearance of two triangles there. One is a, uh, an absolutely a, almost hallucinatory illusion of one in the foreground. <clears throat> we so to say fill in uh, our internal representations with what we take to be the missing lines. I should mention, by the way, that Kanitsa, uh, who was the originator of a large family of these illusions, uh, was very much influenced by a tradition that goes back to Brentano. You know, it was influenced by uh, students of Minong in the uh, uh, 1920s. Uh, so it's no accident that you know, uh, he thought of these figures, you know, which I will call intentional in existence. But with a familiar mushing together of phonetic features in normal speech, you know, think of you know, easy examples are what you doing or the many different pronunciations of extraordinary, extraordinary, extraordinary. Uh, the essentially segmented SLEs in terms of which listeners hear their native language uh, <clears throat> seem also to be intentional in existence, no more real than Kanitsa triangles. Uh, Charles Hockett, a famous linguist in the 1950s, uh, made a famous comparison of uh, speaking language to having a, uh, eggs on a belt that uh, uh, were uh, passed through a ringer and then uh, and mushed up. And then uh, the hearer had to infer from the mess of the issues at the end of the uh, uh, ringer what the original order and character of the eggs were. Uh, a, a, the original character was, um, and uh, it's a it's a comparison that I've read is, is frequently uh, uh, um, cited in the uh, phonological and phonetic literature. Two philosophers of linguistics, uh, Rob Stanton and Chris Vigri, uh, uh, Vigri, uh have argued that foliosism would have deleterious and, in fact, even politically unacceptable consequences for much of our linguistic talk depriving social linguistics of a subject matter and making it impossible to talk about the suppression of minority languages. Since their worries may be shared by others, I'll briefly reply to them in the next section, section two of my talk, before going on to the main section, uh, dealing with uh, John and Gabe Dupre's um, uh, worries. Uh, well, two other philosophers, John Collins and Gabe Dupre, seem largely to agree with foliism, but wonder how representations of syntactic features could have the intentional content I claim they have if there are no real phenomena for those representations to represent. For non-philosophers, uh, intentional content is the idiom that philosophers use, 
to talk about whatever it is that makes a representation of or about something, as in a representation of or about a person, a cube, a goddess, or say an infantile clause. Uh, indeed, uh, uh, Collins and Dupre take my foliism even further than I do, claiming it isn't, it isn't clear what it would even mean for an acoustic blast to have syntactic structure. How possibly could an acoustic blast have the structure of a syntactic tree or realize a token of spec or an unarticulated uh, big pro? And if nothing in the stream could possibly realize such categories, how could any internal states even possibly represent them? I'll return to this worry in section three. But first, again, the uh, both more basic alarms raised by um, <coughs> uh, Stenton and Viguet. Uh, okay, the innocuousness of foliosism. Actual SLE tokens are not required for, for Chomskyan theory. As Chomskyans seem to be quite rightly stressed, their proposals are about the character of computations over representations in an eye language realized in the brain, in the computational system of your brain. And the point of, of, of Chomsky linguistic theory is to characterize uh, those computations and representations. Whether or not there exist any real things in, in the world that are uh, represented. And again, only a far too common uh, use mention confusion would identify the SLEs with their representations as Chomskyans sometimes, alas, do. But although linguists may talk about, although linguists may talk about reps, representations of SLEs when speaking about their theory, in their actual practice, they seem to abide by the ordinary talk of spoken or written tokens of SLEs. Saying, for example, one expression, for example, the word doubt, C commands and licenses another ever in she doubts he'll ever, ever reply. <clears throat> what are we to make of this? I argue in my book that linguists are engaged in what I call a representational pretense. For the sake of, for the sake of expository convenience, they only pretend that the internal reps represent anything in the external world. So they don't have to constantly clutter all their claims with representation of. E.g., I'll be pretty, instead of stating the usual claims about negative polarity items, they would have to say a representation of a licensor must represent an NPI as he commanded by his licensor. And if you go through the, you know, most of the principles in prin uh, of, uh, of, of universal grammar, you'd see it would just make a tremendous headache of the statement of the rules, be constantly inserting representation. So they just, it's easier just to pretend, you know, that. Uh, they're talking about something real. The view is not as outrageous or unusual as it may sound. Versions have it, I have versions of it have, I think, but at least implicit in phonetics since at least Jesperson in 1924. Uh, I give a, in my book, I give a lot of other citations of other people who you know, uh, anticipated it. In general, a representational pretense is often adopted by psychologists and historians in talking about the content of people's thoughts and perceptions, but it is simply not relevant whether those thoughts and perceptions are about anything real. Thus, vision theorists will talk about condensed figures, colors, and cubes without concern with whether there actually are such external phenomena as colors, perfect cubes, or condensed figures. And Greek historians might well say Zeus transformed himself into a swan when they know full well it is the myth. They will talk this way for the obvious convenience it affords the expression of, a con of the content of a mental state, of the content of mental states, e.g. that vision represents a figure as a triangle. Uh, Husserl also discusses this when he discusses the notion of epoche, of bracketing in psychology, uh, scholars who are interested. <clears throat> Virtually all the things we want to say about language or languages or SLEs can be easily paraphrased by the foliast closely enough in terms of shared internal computational systems that Chomskyans call I languages. This is essentially my reply to, to uh, Stenton and Begay. They're just not seeing how you know, the, the Chomskyans are perfectly easy to talk about, uh, perfectly willing and able to talk about I languages, specified in terms of internal shared phonology, phonology lexical items, parameter settings, and or features of lexical items, and illusory contents of perception and speech intentions. <clears throat> Note this. So, uh, yeah, for suppressed language, you might want to say, well, people, you know, certain people with a certain eye language, Cayuga, uh, are no longer allowed to speak it or discouraged from speaking it. Right? 
I'm, you're simply talking about the I language. You, know, you don't have to talk about an external language. Note that Foleyism is not intended to make any recommendations at all about ordinary thought and talk regarding SLEs, any more than philosophers or psychologists who claim that colors don't exist in the external world are about to go down to the forest and tell them that roses aren't red or tell the police when they're stopped that there are no colored traffic lights, right? <clears throat> I join Chomskyans and many other recent philosophers who regard the truth conditions of claims in general to be highly context sensitive. Foleyism is simply a claim in one particular scientific context where the concern is to determine the role of representations of linguistics in a fashion as free of human interests as possible. Most people, likely even most linguists, don't share such a rarefied concern. Consequently, Pache, Senton, and Viguet, uh, foliism doesn't entail that linguists who do not acknowledge the illusions are deeply misguided. I don't think for a second they are. It's perfectly fine. The issue is simply not relevant to their interests, and so considerations of relevance mandates speaking about SLEs as we ordinarily do. One way to perhaps make foliism less implausible than Stanton and Viguet fear is to note that in most cases, external acoustic stimuli may approximate SLEs in ways determined by probabilistic assessments of the sort proposed by Chomsky and Halley in the sound pattern of English, which we'll discuss below. <coughs> Just as many visual stimuli approximate triangles. You never see a perfect triangle, but you, know, you get things, you know, approximate them well enough. <coughs> Excuse me. Here is elsewhere, this is likely the way that is likely the way that evolution often, as Stenton and Bigay put it, works, works its magic. Our perceptual systems, like stochastic voice recognition systems that are now common, uh, they satisfy matching the world not perfectly, but closely enough for purposes at hand. Ecumenical, uh, uh, this is a, actually, a, a, this is by being ecumenical about e languages. <clears throat> Perhaps there are phenomena such as register, style, and conventions of speech that would be better, be, that would be better captured by talk of e-languages, such as English and Cayuga, as it's a term that Chomsky introduced as a contrast. And in, uh, in my book, I allow that one could be a lot more ecumenical than um, uh, Chomsky sometimes seems to be, okay, <clears throat> about, you know, about them. I gather, uh, I say, gather ye laws and regularities where ye may, and if some can be stated in terms of e-languages, this would not detract in the slightest from a theory of i-languages, whose properties would explain any of those of the, uh, of those whatever e-languages you want to talk about. Or from a foliest claim that all, all the speakers of such e-languages share the same illusions. E-languages might be a useful categorization of illusory phenomena, much as cannot the figures are. And just talk of cannot figures off. Social conventions regarding sufficiently stable illusory SLEs are no more problematic than conventions that might exist regarding Kadizo lettering, okay, or the colors of traffic lights. This is a sort of technical aside. Notice that we do speak of e-languages, we shall likely have to engage in the same representational pretense that I claim about there being actual tokens of words. Uh, that I claim we have to, uh, in the Chomsky case, and we should also have to give up the extensionality of the E language, which, uh, which couldn't be identified with a class of tokens, right? You couldn't identify an E language now as a class of utterances. But this may not be quite the loss it would have been in more behavioristic days. It's hardly a folk notion, and so I, I just drop it as not being uh, interesting anymore. Okay, a more interesting objection is contrastive semantics. Stanton and Bigay do try to provide a general argument, argument against foliism. <clears throat> uh, this is from their uh, comment, commentary on me. The very idea of a global linguistic illusion is mystified. Mistakes are posterior to truths. Fakes make sense only in contrast to the real thing. And uh, Alex Barber and John Collins in an earlier paper uh, make a similar argument, although I'm not sure John would still uh, defend this. Uh, in any case, such an argument seems to presume an extremely strong, implausible, contrastive semantic theory. You only have, you know, things only make sense if there's a you know, real contrast in the world. And that, would, and that any such theory would have to make, do account for the apparent intelligibility of familiar denials of the reality of colors and triangles and, and of, uh, in the ordinary conception of time, as Einstein worries about. <clears throat> 
But in any case, I allow uh, in section 9.4 that standard IPA photetic features might be per perceived under ideal conditions. And I want to argue that those conditions might serve as the correct conditions of the needed sort. But in reply, Collins and Dupre press, press further, however, and wonder whether even this idealization would suffice for the reality of syntactic structure. They ask what it would be like for an acoustic stream to exhibit a syntactic structure such as a hierarchical tree. If there's no answer to such questions, then what sense does it make to claim that the brain internally represents such structure? I'm not sure this question always needs to be answered. I'm not sure I buy this contrast, contrast of semantics that's in the background here. You know, if, for example, are colors, triangles, ghosts, or gods really possible? I, for one, doubt it, as I do in general external semantics. However, I'll go along for the ride here, uh, and I'd like to show, I think my view is compatible with an externalist semantics if you wanted to insist on one. In fact, I think there's not, uh, there's not quite the problem with syntax that Collins and Dupre fear, but it takes a little work to show this. <clears throat> okay, first, highly idealized SLEs. In a standard linguistics te textbook, uh, Eva Fernandez and Helen Cairns, F and C, I'll describe them as, uh, describe the hearer's task as follows. Quote, using information in the acoustic signal, the hearer reconstructs a phonological representation. The hearer enters the lexicon using that phonological representation to retrieve the lexical items that match. Okay. This permits the hearer to recover the semantic and structural details of the words in the message. The next step is to recover the structural organization of the words to create a syntactic representation necessary for recovering the meaning of the sentence. It's roughly the view I want to defend, uh, but it takes a little bit more discussion to defend it. <clears throat> what I find interesting about this proposal, which you can also find in Bever and Purple and in Chomsky and Halley, is the suggestion that what a hearer ultimately recovers in understanding speech is a sequence of lexical items through the identification of phonetic and phonological features that provide identif identificatory signatures of the item. But before developing the idea, I want to put to one side what seems to be a very bad idea that F and C go on casually to suggest, and which I find disturbingly widespread in the linguistic and psychological literature. I'll quote some other people in a minute. There's this you know, <clears throat> treacherous expression in the mind. Soon after the above passage, F and C go on to note the familiar phonetic fact of how a speech sound may vary greatly each time it is actually produced. And you know, they just, this is standard uh, data uh, that, you know, you don't, you can't find the D, the da, and D, da, and do if you look at the acoustic stream, okay. <clears throat> they immediately go on reasonably to ask, so where is the da? To which they revealingly reply, it is in the hearer's mind and not in the physical signal. Now that something exists only in the mind is a, colloquial, is a colloquial way of saying that the thing doesn't really exist at all. For example, the ghost he fears exists only in his mind. However, I suspect that the mind is sometimes taken to be a kind of peculiar shadowy place where our thoughts and the things we think about all freely reside. And that then invites a dangerous inference from the mind to the brain. Since as any hard-headed scientist knows, uh, any hard-headed scientist knows, of course, the mind is in fact the brain. Then if so, then the D and other SLEs must be in the brain. Thus, uh, in his commentary on my, uh, 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 just the last month actually, it appeared in Mind Language uh, uh, in April, uh, the linguist David Adger in his own 2022 20, comments uh, claims that SLEs, quote, constitute the stuff of mind, the components out of which the mind is built. And he proceeds to argue that, quote, if the mind is the brain, then claiming that some aspects of it is built out, some aspect of it is built out of SLEs does, of course, allow the inference that SLEs are abstract, hypothesized components out of which the brain is built. Since the relevant components of a computational grammar are representations, the SLEs must be identical to those representations. And so we have a collapse of the use mentioned distinction of the sort that I was deploring earlier where what is represented by a representation becomes identified with the representation itself. On behalf of this identification, uh, Adger quotes a passage often quoted in this regard 
uh, uh, he quotes with approval Chomsky's 2000 claim that, quote, the word representation is not in linguistics, it is not to be understood relationally as representation of or as any relation to the world. So he quote, you know, Adger quotes that bit. However, I think it's crucial to quote the entire passage where that passage of Chomsky appears. Uh, this is the, ent the entire passage on you know, Chomsky 2000 where he talks this way. The internalist study of language speaks of representations of various kinds, but we need, need not ponder what is represented, seeking some objective construction from sounds to things. The representations are postulated entities to be understood in the manner of a mental image of a rotating cube, <laughs> oddly enough, whether it be the result of tachistoscopic presentations of a real rotating cube or stimulation of the retina in some other way or imagined for that matter. But what is a representation or image of a rotating cube, particularly if no cube has been presented? Specifying what a representation is of is obviously crucial to understanding just what kind of representation it is and to making generalizations about such kinds. Necker cubes are ambiguous. Uh, PPs require NP complements. <clears throat> and so we may well need to ponder what sort of thing a non-existent cube or SLE is. A short reply to the too hasty inference from in the mind to in the brain need merely note that no one would be tempted to identify a rotating cube in the mind with a neural state. There really are no cubes rotating in anyone's brains that I know of. <laughs> Why should SLEs be treated any differently? Note for starters, in fact, something that uh, Stendhal and Gay noticed uh, that uh, no neuro neuropsychological state rhymes with another. In any case, foliism seems a more modest alternative, not cluttering the mind with cubes or rhymes. <clears throat> but the further issue that Collins and Dupre have raised needs to be addressed. Where does the content of syntactic representations come from if nothing in the external world could conceivably answer to them? Instead of locating SLEs in the mind, I suggest, as I've said, regarding them as intentional in existence, things we think about and take ourselves off to perceive that which don't exist, such as Kanata tree uh, figures. Now, one species of intentional in existence are idealizations, as in perfect vacuums for Newton, perfectly elastic molecules for Boyle, and perhaps, depending how you think about it, linguistic competence abstracted away from performance for Chomsky. Anyway, I'm all for idealizations. And sometimes you idealize to quite impossible things like perfect cubes, but sometimes maybe they are possible like linguistic competence. And at least in some cases, the ideal objects might be possibly instantiated. Thus, some of the ideal rational agents of economics might actually be possible. And certainly some idealizations of the principles of grammar could be realized in an I language in a brain. I want to argue that there's actually an idealization of syntactical SLEs that could allow for the possibility in principle of their instantiation in the acoustic stream. Phonetics might seem the last place to find ideal instances. There's the rapid speech of, of auctioneers, a slurred, speech, a slurred speech of drunks and of George when he's talking too fast, uh, the non-vocalized speech of someone whispering, the static riddle of announcements on the subway. There would seem to be so much variability in which phonetic phenomena are produced that general, generalizations would seem to be hard to come by. But Chomsky is, of course, well known for bringing the Galilean method of idealization to linguistics, pointing to systems of syntactic, semantic, and phonological competence underlying the diversity of languages, dialects, and pronunciations. Why not one for phonetics as well, which might relate the phonology to articulators, articulators and or acoustic forms? One reason, which I actually am sympathetic to, Chomskyans are reasonably skeptical that there are systematic theories relating the internal states of an I language to phenomena external to them. Since at least at some point between the I language and the world, the exigencies of context and people's varying degrees of ingenuity enter and threaten to render the connection theoretically unmanageable. I share this skepticism. However, the phonologists, um, uh, Hale and Reese, I think he pronounces his name, uh, usefully divide up the connection between grammar and speech, distinguishing processes of phonological computation from what seem to be a, a, a system of regular, what they call transductions, that relate phonological representations to specific motor activity. I actually don't like their use of the word, I think they misuse the word transduction, but that won't be relevant today. 
Um, and they call you know, such a system a cognitive phonetics, uh, which they think is analogous to universal grammar. It's important to see that CP also allows for insightful idealizations abstracted from differences in the way that the grammar, the phonology, and the CP system, the cognitive phonetic systems, come to be actually used and realized in different people in varying contexts. And this is a quote from uh, Volonik and Reese. The university, universality of CP is merely a reflection of the fact that there exists a biological object we may call the phonetic implementational system. The question whether there are various variations in individual phonetic implementational systems among human need uh, among humans, sorry, need not detain us. Just as the fact that no two human being, humans have identical eyes does not hinder biologists from studying the human eye. For starters, consider the international phonetic alphabet, which does seem to capture a great deal of regularity in the way speech is at least represented in the brain, even if the results of those representations may, for various reasons, issue in varying sounds. Here, phonetic features are identified in terms of articulatory gestures under certain terms of schematic drawings of a typical vocal tract. I'm sure you've all seen that. I won't linger on it. Of course, it is doubtful that anyone's actual vocal tract corresponds exactly to the above schemata, much less that the rapid flow of normal speech fully realizes distinctive phonetic features, since they are rarely, if ever, produced in isolation. And that's the big problem. I mean, you know, we, we, we run everything together because we're efficient in, in uh, speaking. But one might use the IPA and the above schemata as idealizations of the effects a specific phonetic instruction would have in a highly idealized speaker's mouth and on its representation in a hearer's language, by language, in splendid isolation from other factors, for example, instructions for the other features. Thus, the instruction plus nasal might be to lower the soft palate in such a way to produce a certain idealized sound and complete abstraction from the anticipations, assimilations, and displacements caused by combination with other instructions. The phonetic features can, in this way, be defined dispositionally in terms of their idealized effects. So I want to say this is the way actually you might even define the features. Uh, you, you think of them uh, dispositionally in terms of the, this idealized effects in idealized in the articulatory system on the CP systems of normal human beings. <clears throat> it does seem that we perceive normal speech in terms of representations of ideal phone features. I'm going to hedge here because <laughs> you know, the more one reads the phonological literature, the more difficult it gets to understand it. Uh, and I'm going to hedge between phonetic or phonological, both of which I think are probably going to be involved in perception of speech. And I just I'll just use capital phone uh, to mean that disjunction. But all, that may, but all that may be very well for the perception of speech sounds. What about the perception of syntax? Here it's important to remember that there's more to phenomenology than mere phenomenality, one of my favorite mottos. <clears throat> there's more to perceptual experience than merely the sensory objects and qualia on which one could easily fasten attention. There's also how it is structured. And that structure might not be revealed by any specific items one might introspect. Vision seems to impose a fairly elaborate spatial temporal structure on visual experience without itself being a specific object of that experience. We don't see space time itself. That structure is more likely to reveal, be revealed indirectly by experiments that reveal the effects the structures have on experience, more on, you know, on, more on those experiments than on mere introspective reports. Another category that's really important to bear in mind, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with, so I won't spend a lot of time, is non-conceptual content. Uh, when Chomsky and say that you know, children, for example, bear cognitive relations to the principles and parameters of grammar, they certainly don't mean that children are, you know, yes, <laughs> are fully as conceptualized as professional linguists. A natural move in such cases is to appeal to what has come to be called non-conceptual content or the intentional content of states that explain perceptual abilities without being generally available to cognition in the way that you know, the, the practiced linguist uh, uh, contents are, in the way that concepts typically are. An elegant example is, is provided by the Mach diamond uh, square. This is uh, noticed by the physicist uh, 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 Ernest Mach uh, around 1914. Experiences of diamond shapes can involve precisely the same objective stimuli as experiences of square ones, right? Rotated. 
As Chris Peacock stressed, you know, quote, when something is perceived as a diamond, the perceived symmetry is about the bisection of its angles, when as a square about the bisections of its sides. But of course, even though an animal or a child might distinguish the two figures in this way, neither might have the concept symmetry or bisection. Clearly, Chomskyans are attributing non-conscious, non-conceptual content to states of the, of the eye languages and associated systems such as the parser. Specifically, non-conceptual structural descriptions of phrases in the eye language, what I call NSC, NCSDs. That's what I think yeah, the argument's about. How could they have content? Now, what is the evidence that speakers are deploying such NCSDs in their linguistic perception? Psycholist linguistics has not been shy in providing some, and I'm assuming that most people are probably familiar with some, you know, roughly some of this evidence. So I'll go through it quickly. Uh, I'll just mention some families of examples that strongly suggest, I don't pretend they, you know, apodactically demonstrate, but they strongly suggest that people's responses are due to hearing the stimuli as having a specific syntactic structure, despite problematic meanings. Uh, see the, my paper and references for fuller discussion. Oh, uh, there's meaningless syntax, as in was really going to slidey tubs, or <laughs> common philosophical claims like the secret as such, as secret separates and already institutes a negativity. It is a negation that denies itself. You know, I take it most people could parse that. I'm not sure very many people can understand exactly what it's saying. Uh, there are Gordon paths. You know, the famous example is the horse race past the barn fell, which I'm sure you've all heard of. Uh, but so, so experimenters actually work with more detailed ones. Uh, so presented with while Mary bathed, <laughs> while Mary bathed the baby played in the crib. And he would ask, did Mary bathe the baby? Heroes will say she did, okay, because they'll parse the baby as the object of bathed. <clears throat> There's structural priming. Speakers and hearers repeat sentence structure they recently encountered quite independently of message meaning. Presented with a picture that could be described either by the active sentence, lightning is striking the church, or its passive equivalent, the church is being struck by lightning, hearers were more likely to offer the active, uh, number eight, if they were primed with semantically unrelated, uh, semantically unrelated active, one of the fans punched the rest of the referee, than if they were primed with the referee was punched by one of the fans, and vice versa. Lastly, uh, there's a lovely category of slips of the ear. <clears throat> in, investigated ex extensively by this fellow Bond. <clears throat> a listener often makes radical changes in phonology and syntax, completely lacking in semantic appropriateness. Uh, he, he gives, he, he's collected a lot of examples apparently. I'm gonna go back to bed until, until the news has been heard as, I'm gonna go back to bed and crush the noodles. Okay. And I seem to be thirsty has been heard as, I sing through my green Thursday. As Bond concludes, Quote, listeners are open to extremely implausible utterances, not at all constrained by semantic or pragmatic appropriateness, but which noted nota bene are still syntactically well formed. Okay, so what I, what I want to claim explains this and much similar evidence is that perception involves the imposition of ideal structure. If hearers are hearing speech as having syntactic structure, they certainly can't be picking this up directly from the actual acoustic stimulus. The reason I've provided. I don't think, you know, we actually utter words or phrases or sentences, <clears throat> which as we've noted is woefully impoverished in this regard. But suppose following my earlier suggestion of section 3.2, that they hear speech in terms of ideal phon features. <clears throat> we may then follow the, the, we might, then might follow the further suggestion we quoted from F and C, that, quote, the hearer enters the lexicon using that phonological representation to retrieve the lexical atoms that match. And this permits the hearer to recover the semantic and structural details of, of the words in the message. Thus, hearers access the lexicon using font representations as a signature to retrieve the lexical items that themselves have those font features and which also have semantic and syntactic features, which when processed by the grammar would determine the NCSDs uh, NCSDs of structure of syntactic structure that the hearer would hear the sequences having, precisely as I claim the experimental evidence, evidence suggests they do. Chomsky and Halley actually put the point, you know, many years ago rather well, I think. Speech perception is an active process, a process in which the physical stimulus that strikes the hearer's ear 
is used to form hypotheses about the deep structure of the sentence. Given the deep structure and the rules of grammar, all other representations of the, sentences, of the sentence can be derived, including in particular the phonetic transcription. These derived representations are used by the speaker to check his hypothesis against his, his hypothesis about the deep structure against the external stimulus, which provides the data that stands in the most direct relationship with the phonetic transcription. Given the stability, and this is really crucial to my argument, the stability that uh, Volanik and Reese stress obtains for the CP system across speakers, this process would then provide a basis for claiming at least the ideal phon sequences could be said to instantiate the syntactic structures they retrieve. I repeat that because that's really the crucial, it's my reply to John and to Dupre. <clears throat> at least the ideal font sequences could be said to instantiate the syntactic structures they retrieve, even though the noises themselves, as mere noises considered apart from human perceivers, do not. The ideal font dis dispositions provide the basis for identifying a sequence of ideal font features as at least an ideal external entity having syntactic features. It is in this way that, as I replied to S the earlier, actual acoustic phenomena approximate genuine, genuine SLEs. Note I say structure, structures. Phon sequences can be ambiguous, you know, standard examples, flying planes can be dangerous, the duck is ready to eat, and of course, unparsable, as in which book did you believe the claim that John, that Bill read? Uh, and it's nice to compare, I, it's limited to compare that with uh, ambiguous and impossible Necker cubes, right? The one on the, the left being ambiguous, uh, the one on the right being impossible. None of this implies that a speaker or hearer could actually produce or understand such ideal sequences if they were actually presented with them. As a speech theorist of, of Lieberman pointed out, fully articulated phonological speech would likely be incomprehensible. And this is a quote from Lieberman. The problem is that at normal rates, speech produces from eight to 10 segments per second, and for short stretches, at least double that number. Rates that would high, the rates that high would strain the temporal resolving power of the ear. So we, you know, it's likely that if actually we were to hear these ideal sequences I'm referring to, we couldn't understand them, right? But that's all right. You know, uh, there's lots of you know, perfectly acceptable sentences, grammatical sentences in your natural language that you can't understand if you're presented with them. <clears throat> so the actual realization of the idealized syntactic structure can only be known indirectly by inference from the present representations of sequences by which hearers can parse normal speech. A fact also evidence, of course, in our likely inability to process just any, any finite sequence of phonemes, no matter how long or otherwise acceptable they might be. In sum, if dispositions to compute representations of idealized font features do in fact account for ordinary font perception, they would thereby provide correctness conditions for all the representations of syntactic and spent, sorry. Ah, oh, what are, I lost it. So they would thereby provide correctness conditions for all the representations of syntactic and semantic features that those font represent representations recruit via the lexical items for which they serve as signatures. Okay. Maybe I want to linger on that. That is my main claim. Right. That's the conclusion. Claim. Conclusion, I hope I've at least made a case for the plausibility of foliism and how linguistics linguistics can flourish very well in the absence of any actual SLEs, even in a way compatible with an externalist semantics. Pache, Collins, and Dupre, the representations need not, be, need not correspond to actually realized SLEs in the acoustic stream in order to enjoy their content. And Pache, Santon, and Biguet, uh, actually, actually realized SLEs are not required in the least for an even politically correct Chomskyan linguistics. Many thanks to Nick Allett, John Collins, and Gabe Dupre. Gabe couldn't make it. I invited him to today's conference, but he couldn't make it. He was another conference to go to. Uh, they all provided very helpful comments on drafts of this talk. Thank you very much. Let me go back to the main claim. Thank you, George. Uh, that was super interesting. Um, it is time for the I hope I didn't speak too fast. <laughs> Um, if you have questions for George, please raise your hand. John. Go ahead, yeah. Hi. Um, I don't, 
I speak to George all the time about these issues, so I don't want to <coughs> take up too much time because other people might uh, have things to say <coughs> that are new to him. But uh, so I'll try and be quick. So just two points. Um, I'm worried maybe the extent to which you're assuming a kind of lexicalism. So <clears throat> the idea that the, the, um, the various um, idealized phonetic features act as um, um, sig sig signatures. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and they take you then to the uh, lexical items which you then retrieve. <clears throat> but um, then the question is, well, why would that give you syntax? Presumably, that's going to give you syntax because you're assuming a kind of lexicalism where you take the syntax to be a kind of projection from the lexical item. I, I take so, the syntax to be a computational system that take, takes as input the features of the lexical items and then you know does very fancy computations and gives you an output. So what? But then why wouldn't you just, um, as it were, perceive a sequence? of kind of words what i mean well, why is it okay, i am assuming lexicalism to this degree that the relevant features on which the uh, the i language is is uh, computing are, are are syntactic and semantic features in lexical items okay if that were okay. true i'd have to start all over again and you know have some other story okay and it uh, seems uh, let, me, that... let, me, let me do say something that you and i have talked about in conversation which i didn't mention in the slides here and that is of course there may well be um, uh, uh, a machinery inside the uh, I language <coughs> uh, involving representations that maybe don't actually correspond to anything, you know, you know, it, you know, it's heard in the acoustic stream. And you might wonder, how did they get their meaning? Well, at that point, and I won't go into this unless people really want, want to know how it works, uh, I would appeal to ramification, as you know. Okay, I'd say, okay, yeah. you know, now you, what you do is you take the whole theory, the whole, the whole I language, and you define each of the terms in it by their relations to each other and to the input and output. And that will okay. give you, I think, you know, the content then for those inter you know, internal yeah. states that themselves don't represent something in the acoustic stream. Okay, but my other issue then quickly is, um, I'm not sure if you really answered the problem in this sense. <clears throat> so if you've got something with, so putative content, right? So you, you've got this kind of putative representation there. And then you're asking, uh, where does it get its content from? Or why does it have this content as opposed to that content? <clears throat> then you're telling a story about how this representation gets, as well, sort of deployed. But that doesn't, or projected on, onto the stream. But that doesn't then seem to ask, answer a question, well, where does it get its content from in the first place? Ah, good, good. You're absolutely right. Look, um, uh, unfortunately, I only had 50 minutes today, so I couldn't lay out my full theory of content. If you like. <laughs> <laughs> and I, in fact, I don't have a th full theory of content. I don't think anybody should pretend to have one. It's a much, much too difficult issue. In my book, I do uh, endorse uh, what I won't go into here. Um, uh, uh, you know, a version of Jerry Fodor's asymmetric dependency. It's actually a version of put together some suggestions of Paul Horich and, and Fodor and puts it in a more modest package, I think. Uh, the idea is that uh, the um, uh, meaning constitutive conditions for representation, the, you know, the content conditions uh, are those on which all uses of the expression uh, asymmetrically depend, asymmetrically and explanatorily depend. Uh, again, give me another hour and I'll go through and explain all, all that, but that's roughly the idea. I should say for the record, by the way, it's quite interesting. You know, uh, in conversation, Fodor said that he had phonetics in mind when he thought of this theory. He thought, you know, how could phoneme, you know, ph 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 phonemic uh, symbols get their meaning? It's because of asymmetric dependency. And I would pursue that for the rest of the uh, uh, rest of the terms, at least in this in, in linguistics, in right, the theory of the generative system of the I language. I'm not endorsing it as a general theory of uh, yeah. content, which I don't okay. think you should pretend to have. Okay, great. Well, we'll speak again. <laughs> I hope so. Yeah. Uh, David Lindemann.
Hey, George, thank you for the talk. It was very interesting. I haven't read your book yet, but I intend to. Um, Do. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Um, uh, what you're working on here hooks up a lot with what I've been thinking about. And uh, I think we're, I thought we were coming at it from very different angles, but some of the things you just said in response to John actually makes me wonder whether actually we're closer than I thought. So <clears throat> is it your view that the reference for terms for intentional in existence are located in a sort of notional world like spots in a structure specified by a Ramsey now, sentence, on. those terms the, the, the terms are located in your brain uh, yeah okay so we do depart. I think, <laughs> when, I think about, when a person thinks about Zeus I presume they've got a some kind of representation in their brain which is causally efficacious and is responsible for their, you know, chat about Zeus. Are, are you a nominalist? Uh, do you, uh... Ah, well, I try to avoid all the big isms, right? No. Well, yeah, yeah. So I'm what just wondering. Think, if, what do I know, think about properties in general? You know, yeah, yeah, we don't even have another tw uh, 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 twelve hours for that. That would be, you know, uh, yeah. To talk about properties, uh, which I don't so, think, anybody, so, which I don't think anybody understands yet. So I was thinking, you know, if you accept that there are structures, um, sure, and we could just. So, okay, so we've got these terms uh, in our language is, which refer to things you want to say are not really things at all. They're really nothing at all. They're intentional in existence. But the terms have meaning. Uh, maybe we can specify that to some degree by providing Ramsey sentences for those. Well, terms. a combination of Ramsey sentence and the asymmetric tendency. That's uh, why. Yeah, so, so I was just thinking, well, here was the thought, um, and maybe it's not terribly well formed, but the idea was you could think of the Ramsey sentences for the terms for intentional in existences as specifying nodes in a sort of cognitive structure, which is kind of a, uh, a sort of cognitive niche uh, in the umwelt. And these could be construed as affordances of some sort in an extended sense, a la Dennett. Okay, um, hold on. <laughs> four expressions that it would take me too much time to express my reservations about. Uh -huh. <laughs> Umwelt, um, uh, yeah. Dennett, <laughs> Dennett, <Yeah. laughs> uh, affordances, uh, and so forth. I mean, yeah. and, and I don't know what, what you mean by niche. Well, yeah, I don't, okay. I don't think I have to take those questions on. This is a very mm -hmm. modest theory that I think is is quite close to actually how phonologists and linguists talk. You know, it simply has this you know funny claim that yeah you know, they're just pretending these things exist. Now, yeah. you know, how you understand this pretense and how you give a general theory of meaning that allows for such expressions and such usage, I think is quite complicated. Gareth, you know, Gareth Evans, you know, was one of the people who originally had this idea of pretense. Uh, yeah. And I don't think his his account of negative existentials works. It's it's quite complicated to work this out. But I think what I've said does capture a, a, a reasonable and natural way of thinking about you know phonetic and linguistic talk. Yeah, I, I was trying to under, I was trying to get a grip on how to talk about your talk about how they talk. Uh, and and you just I was, pretend. You just pretend. Yeah, I, I know. I, but you know, I've never I, been, I, I I've never been I, satisfied. I think, Evan, I think yeah. Evans rightly perceived that that was a really a, a serious and interesting option. Working it out exactly as the semantics of negative existentials is, is a headache, is hard. Yeah. Uh, and I'm not pretending to do that. But I want to say it, it seems to be a perfectly reasonable and natural move since we know people engage in pretense all the time. Why shouldn't linguists do it in order to express the content of uh, subject um, uh, eye language? Yeah, well, I have some things to say to that response, but I don't want to take up too much time because I see some hands up. But, yeah. Actually, David, one thing I wanted to you know, press on you, I was, I was going to ask you during your session, I didn't want to bring it up then. Um, you know, the view I express here in re response to uh, Stanton and Vigay, which is that, um, <clears throat> look, don't, don't get so hot and bothered about this. You know, reality appro approximates it. You know, acoustic um, a blast approximate. Um, uh, SLEs along the lines that uh, Halley and, and other speech you know, of uh, 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 other phoneticists have proposed, you know, by kind of probabilistic estimates. Okay, and uh, one thing I just you know 
we can talk about it some other time, is that I think that's an interesting way of thinking about, you know, the Davidson claim that all our claims were, you know, you know prima facie are true. Mm. I could imagine that virtually all the claims we make are only approximately true. Mm. We would have gotten by perfectly, you know, well. Mm. Uh, ultimately, it has to be cashed out somewhere, I suppose, in quantum physics or something, right, to get the you know, literal truths. But uh, life, our lives would be perfectly happy, right, if we were only approximately right about most things, like triangles on the blackboard. Good, okay. good. Thank that's you. A, yes. a, uh, a I'll, I'll be in, I'll be in touch. Really, I'd like to talk about this more. In, in relationship to your Davidsonian. But you apparently are, live right up the street from me in Washington. So, right? Uh, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Some time at all. Definitely. Definitely. Thank you. Okay. The next one here is uh, Shaso. Yeah, Sasha will be. Um, yeah. So. Yeah, I, I won't pretend that I was able to follow half of this because, I have, as I have told you, I'm not uh, a philosopher, right? But yeah. perhaps hey, listen, I, can... I couldn't follow half of yours either. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> but 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 maybe maybe I can uh, uh, <laughs> provide a, a useful piece of information that you might like uh, because I have a, a confession uh, to make. I am actually moonlighting as a phonologist as well. Oh, great, great. Yeah. You, can, you can correct me then. <laughs> Yeah, it's really no, hard to the, get it right. the, 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 thing, the thing is that I work within a framework that is not really well known. It's called government phonology, and there is also dependency phonology that is sort of um, a kind of uh, a friendly fr framework. And these frameworks use very different features than your classical phonology, right? Because all the features in your classical phonology are really, ever since SPE, they are based on articulation. Yeah, right. right. Uh, impossible to pronounce in isolation and stuff like that. So the, the government phonology actually works with, um, they, they call these features elements. They are monovalent privative features, either there or not. And they kind of stand for in, in direct relation. The idea is that they stand in direct relation to the acoustic signal. So basically, yeah. you're trying to pick out the cues from yeah. the acoustic signal to get uh, uh, to extract those uh, elements. So, for example, you might have you have three elements for the corner vowels R, E, and U. And let's say you know E. You just recognize it because there is a bloody big gap between your first and second format and stuff like that. Um, but, but I, I, you don't have to go further because I, I, I'm very sympathetic. That's perfectly reasonable, and, it, and it might, it's compatible with what I'm saying. Your, no, no, this is why I, this is why I mentioned it. This is mind. this is why I mentioned it because when you talk about these font features, I was actually reminded of the elements. So the suggestion would be kind of you know maybe there is a fit so that you can have a phonological theory behind what you're saying that actually says stuff that is you know along these ways. Yeah, sure. Yeah. That's all. Yeah, no, I was simply taking, look, what I like, uh, uh, what I thought was convenient about this way of presenting it was, look, everybody is familiar with the IPA, and all you have to do is just sort of think about what on the world is it trying to do. Well, true, well, true, well, but I, no phonologist, no phonologist on earth, neither my school nor anybody else actually thinks that IPA is phonology per se. That's, well, that's a big well, stretch. It could, be, <laughs> it could be phonetics. I, mean, I don't care. It could be phonetics. Okay. Uh, all I cared was that uh, that you had a way of identifying them under highly idealized conditions, okay, in splendid isolation, right, the thing being pronounced, and you'd associate a certain, and I presume it's, in the end, it's going to be some pairing of a, of a motor command and an acoustic signal, but in highly idealized isolation, that's all that's really essential. The now, fact, the fact is actually that rely more on the acoustic, people, that's fine. The fact is actually that people who work in element theory, one of the ideas there is that you might perhaps don't even need such idealized conditions after oh. all, because the speech signal, it turns out in the end, is very, very robust. So the, the elements that are proposed, one thing for to propose them, it's for the phonological behavior, but then it turns out that basically the, re, the, the ones that we really know are the correct ones seem to have very, very robust signatures. So perhaps you don't even need such highly, uh, such highly idealized. Maybe, maybe. I'm not the skeptical. I mean, you, you, given, as I said, the range of variation in people's pronunciation of their language, 
from auctioneers to town drunks, right? And to static on this New York subway. As I said, very it's robust. Very surprising to find, you know, there was that very, acoustic signal. Very robust. Okay. So. Well, uh, is there an author you recommend I look at in this regard? Uh, I'll write it down in chat, no problem. Okay, so send it to me because uh, uh, I should say, by the way, that when I started getting interested in phonology some 20 years ago in reply to Chomsky, uh, Sylvan Bromberger, a philosopher, a, a colleague of Chomsky's, said, Georges, <clears throat> um, uh, the disagreements among phonologists are, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, the disagreements among philosophers are nothing compared to the disagreements among phonologists, right? right? True. <laughs> the difference between two philosophers, a phenomenologist and a, you know, and a Buddhist, all right, they're nothing compared to the disagreements you're really encountering in phonology. But thank you. Uh, send along the uh, uh, references. I'd love to look at I will. Them. I will. Nick. OK, two quick follow-ups, follows up, and, um, and then uh, not a question exactly, but a prod to say more. So uh, the first follow-up is, is to the, the last uh, question we had, which is uh, you and I have actually talked about element phonology before. Remember looking at uh, John yeah, Harris's yeah, book? Yeah. Yes, yeah. I remember my eyes clouding over. Right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I think it's one of the reasons why, um, why you talk about um, an articulatory acoustic, whatever it was you were saying, a blend or something of articulatory yeah, and acoustic yeah. features, because I, I, um, I, I wouldn't let you get away with just talking about articulatory ones. Despite all this strong no, SP, I throw in the acoustic ones. I'm perfectly happy yeah, to have. I, I know you do now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks to you. you. Right. Thank you. Right. No, no, and and so, but but um, the thing is that it works. In my understanding, which is out of date, uh, by the way, is is that the the really good examples are vowels, right? So like the R that uh, Sasha was mentioning, and it gets a it gets a bit more complicated when you get to consonants beyond R anyway. So, but um, Sasha probably has more up-to-date references than I do. Yeah, he's going to send them to me. Yes, good. Second, I, um, just, I just fully, fully agree with you. With when it comes to consonants, it's every man for himself. Yeah. <laughs> or against himself, no problem. Well, no, but see, that's where I think the IPA is certainly getting approximately right. Namely, well, there's, there's the speech commands. Okay. You know, it's how high or low the vowel is, or with what you know, with what uh, articulatory apparatus you're you, you're producing the sound. Yeah, ish, ish. Look at the different ways people can make an ool sound. Anyway. Um, no, no, but remember, we're talking about idealization. Okay. Yeah, I know, I know. So, of course, in ordinary speech, you're going to make it lots of different ways, right? Second brief follow-up, this time to what John said. So if you um, were to buy into, or anyone who was going to buy into all this kind of left periphery and cartography stuff, would have a lot more of the, the sort of stuff that you and John were talking about. I just thought it was worth noting that. So, you know, anytime you hear a sentence, the moment you recognize it's a sentence, you're going to impose, you know, a thousand whatever focus heads and so on on, on in yeah. the left periphery, according to, you know, if you yeah, buy that stuff. Sure, sure. Yeah. And fine. Anyway. All that apparatus, you know, I, I would get its content from essentially ramification. Which yeah. I can discuss I, if you want me to, but it takes about, it would be about five minutes of discussion to. So. Right, right. I mean, another way to go would would be to say, um, you know, if you if it gets too extravagant, then then maybe that's some reason to think that the structure, you know, you shouldn't be imposing quite so much structure that it should be it should be more lexically based. Which is, it's not an in principle thing. No, I see. Anyway, yeah. Um, the that was just a quick comment. The the question. It's not a question. It's just it's the prod to say more. So you were saying, well, you think many ordinary linguists think think like you and I you know that I agree with you on that that they do when, when it comes to the oh you know we're imposing a lot of the stuff that we think we hear or a lot of the stuff that we you know we parse the speech signal as containing or something like that right the stuff the stuff that we're sensitive to um, in in terms of understanding the ultimately the, the meaning of what we're told um, yeah, but I, I think that many ordinary linguists also think that the acoustic blasts are tokens of phonemes, words, and phrases, and so on. I'm talking about ordinary linguists here rather than the rather rarefied world of generativists who've done a bit of philosophy. And um, so, I mean, it's, it's, part, it's partly a comment that they'll buy a lot of what, what you say, but not the pretense stuff. Well, what, and, what will they say about the Hockett claim? The eggs, the smashed eggs. Well, well, I mean, I so you, you heard one. I mean, I, I take it almost 
every phenologist I've ever, or phoneticist I've looked at agrees, there is no segmentation in the stream. Yeah, look, so I, I guess the, the substantive comment or question here is, is that um, if you're imposing structure, then the, the structure doesn't need to be there in the stream for, the, for, for, for that chunk of the stream to be uh, oh, a, to clear, a token but... of the thing you're, rep you're representing. Ah, no, no oh, it, just, I... it just has to be, it just has to be that the token is such that it will cause you to, I mean, you and I have talked about this stuff, you know, the token has to be such that it will cause you to represent it as, as an instance of X, right? Where X I'm is a particular okay, kind yeah. of phrase. Good. And I think that that's quite close to how ordinary linguists think about this. I'm, I'm not saying that, that they're necessarily right so to think, but it seems to be compatible with much of what you're saying. So I, I just wanted to ask you to talk about that and talk about how, how, how independent you think the pretense stuff is from the construing stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, you see, I think pretense is what you get when you reflect carefully about what must be going on. Now, I agree, most linguists, and there's no reason why they should, reflect carefully about these issues. I mean, these issues, you know, don't make much of a difference to, the, to their actual research. But if you actually think about the Hockett, you know, material and the lack of segmentation, and then just think about what it is to identify, you know, some object as a token of a type, there have to be some constraints. And one reasonable constraint is you preserve cr crucial features. So what you're identifying. Well, I claim a crucial feature of any SLE is segmentation. And if there's no segmentation in the stream, then uh, strictly speaking, it doesn't occur there. Now you can talk loosely as though it does, because actually, you know, yes, it does cause you to, you know, this noise, this mushy noise does cause you to think you heard the word extraordinary, uh, um, but, uh, or, you know, the cat is on the mat or whatever. <clears throat> but uh, I think this is what a Hawthorne and um, uh, Lafour call sloppy realism. <laughs> yeah, can I can I push back just just a little bit yeah. here? So one might worry about the disanalogy, or one might think there's a disanalogy with triangles. I mean, we know what it is uh, for something to be, a, you know, as it were, a real triangle, and and they may be physically impossible. And so, okay, we don't see any any triangles out there. We see triangle, you know, things things which are close oh, enough to triangles. Triangle. Things are yeah. Impossible. Triangles, right? Yeah, but in the it context. doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't seem that 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 uh, that's that's quite the, the same. I mean, one has to go separately, probably with phonemes and with lexical items and with phrases. It looks like there might be something different to say about each of those, and it might even be different within phonemes between consonants and vowels for the reasons that we've just been discussing. Um, but you know, it's it's not it's not so obvious that we know exactly what the features are of a you know, a phrase such that an acoustic blast could or couldn't have them in the way that we know that about a triangle. Well, as I say, I thought, okay, I take it that to be an essential feature of an SLE is that it'd be a segment, okay, okay? You know, it's a discrete segment that is computed on, you know, digitally, as it were. That's one of the whole points of, I think, the whole Chomsky program, you know, basic points is that it's digitalized computation. And the thing is, it's uh, speech is not digitalized. The acoustic stream is a uh, is a uh, analog mush, and uh, that seems to be you know by itself a sufficient argument for saying well it's extremely unlikely that you're ever producing tokens. It's not impossible. I don't, I'm not going to go to the wall and saying it's impossible, but it's extremely unlikely. I mean maybe in complete isolation and you you know you give me enough vodka or whatever and I'll say duh, and that will be a token of duh. Okay, I, I, you know, I'm not going to commit, commit myself on that. But on the whole, when you realize, of course, what speech is forced to communicate as quickly as you can, uh, you're not going to bother to segment. Why should you? It's enough that you know, I can produce in you a representation of what I you know, intended to utter. That's fine. You know, so it's a, it's, a, it's a nice philosophical or metaphysical issue about, well, did you actually ever produce it? And I'm simply saying, yeah, there's no need to. Okay? And you probably didn't, given the lack of segmentation. All right, thank you. Peter. Uh, I had a question and, and your last remark just gave me another question. I hope I can get them both in. Um, are you a, 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 a fictionalist about other things? Um, <laughs> yeah. I, mathema I actually, mathematical I out, good, mathematics, good. for example? Hold on, one day, as they say in AA, one day at a time. <laughs> and I think, you know, philosophers should take that advice start. Right? You have to go really case by case. And I think the cases are actually very, very different. Okay. 
I do address this general issue in, if you want, in the chapter, uh, whatever it is, nine, uh, beginning of chapter nine of my book, where I, try, I say what I think the rules of the game are. And the rules of the game are that you find some term that has a, you know, it's sufficiently stable in its usage, right? You know, among people, uh, which color terms turn out not to be very you know, sufficiently stable. But you find a term that's sufficiently stable, and then you decide what are the crucial features of the phenomena which this term refers. And I just said in the case of, of, um, of linguistics, I think it's segmentation. If you didn't have segmentation, then I think the whole game would be over. You couldn't do anything. So segmentation is essential. And since the segmentation is not preserved in any of thing physical, then that's a reason for thinking this thing doesn't exist, okay? And I think that works for lots of other cases. I think rainbows don't exist. I know this, my students get really upset about you know, what I claim that rainbows don't exist. But I think you know, just a few moments reflection on you know, what the hell you're talking about when you talk about the rainbow, you realize, yeah, you know, there's no physical thing that you could identify the rainbow with. I mean, you could you know, do some fancy you know, set theoretic variology, I suppose, uh, but uh, it's pathetic because, you know, no, the rainbow doesn't exist because the essential features of it, its location and its segmentations of colors and so forth, nothing in the world corresponds to that. And so similarly for many, many things, yeah, triangles, squares, um, but not for everything. I'm happy to think lots of things exist. <laughs> oh, okay. So you deny that you're on a slippery slope here. I don't see the slippery slope. As I say, I address this explicitly. I do, I do agree with Quine in, in a moderate way here that this is a kind of a pragmatic issue. There's a kind of pra, you know, a pragmatic issue about whether you take a term you ordinarily use, right, and identify it with something to be spelled out you know, scientifically. Okay. Yeah, well, it depends what you think are the crucial, you know, the crucial properties. And okay. that may be pragmatic. Okay, then I had a question about, uh, this is a question of clarification. So in the acoustical signal itself, which you take to be, I think, mushier than Sasha takes it to be, yeah. uh, do, you, it, do we speak um, fictionally, but do we speak as though there are noun phrases and certain phonological features in that acoustical signal correctly? Yeah, I mean, I think, okay. I think the ordinary unreflective person takes there we have words to be uttered and they're, they're uttering them. Okay, you know, so they're okay. because they're not concerned with these arcane philosophical issues. Well, your formulation at the end was that it's enough that I can produce a token in you. Um, I produce is that a, enough. To, I, I produce a representation in you to, to produce a representation in me. Correct. Of, of, um, that, of those SLEs. Right. Okay, so I have a certain representation. I can cause you to have that representation. That's right. Is that enough for us to say fictionally, perhaps, that the relevant tokens are in the acoustical signal? No. Okay. I mean, the town drunk, I mean, you know, can mumble, oh, I want another drink, and it'll be heard as I want another drink. Um, but I don't think it should be counted as a token of it. I mean, no, you know, almost nobody would, except his wife, might regard that as a token. Uh, uh, okay, so then I, I want to go back to my clarificatory question. So what is it that is fictionally in the acoustical signal? Because I thought that we were speaking as if the same noun phrases and so forth were in the acoustical signal or certain no, phenomena. No, 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 hold on. I, I, you're misstating, I think, my okay. view. Okay. I, I don't think that as you and I speak right now, that we are producing very good SLEs. We're producing approximations to them that are good enough so that we're communicating. You know, I'm producing, presuming you the representations, at least some of the time, uh, that I intend you to have. Uh, it's only under idealization, extreme, you know, the IPA idealization, that you could now designate what the features are and now think of a sequence of them. And now think of that, you know, sequence that would correspond to, you know, a certain string of lexical items that would then have a certain grammatical structure, blah, blah, blah. That's the only way you could speak about there being a, in principle possible to have an actual token. But um, uh, other than that, no, I don't think we produce actual tokens. Uh, just a quick follow-up, just to make sure I understand then. Um, so to take an extreme case, um, let take a signaling situation. So take the fictional story of Paul Revere, and you hang one light if the British are coming by land. So. I hang one light in the, the, the steeple of the Old North Church, uh, thereby uh, 
producing in you a token of the thought that the British are coming by land. Okay. So that, but you don't want to say that that's a linguistic. I, I produced in me a representation of. Uh, okay. Yeah. And intermediate is just, so it could be any sort of signal. Yeah. Any sort of signal that could get me to produce in me the representation. The relevant representation. That's right. Exactly. Okay. And so you don't really care what's intermediate. Um, in yeah, I don't think it makes any difference. Okay. I mean, think about it. Yeah. You know, you and I, I presume, are communicating pretty well right now. Does it matter whether we have actually produced tokens of, of, of the type sentences we're representing? What does it matter to? Who cares? No, not even physicists would care. Okay. I mean, there's an acoustic stream, and we know the, about, about the physics of, of sound and so forth, and that's an interesting theory. But dividing it up into to tokens of, of uh, uh, SLE, SLE types uh, seems to be a fool's errand. No point to it. Um, and if there are no other questions, I have one last question that I've always wanted to ask you. Um, is it, uh, is there some reason you don't want to talk about abstracta as opposed to intentional ident intentional objects of some sort? So yeah, what, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah well, a quick answer. Other people have asked me this. It's a standard question. I think it's really interesting that we perceive speech as tokens. Okay? We don't perceive them as, uh, as types. And I'm not, you know, I'm not wholly happy in, in thinking that there are just types for free just because Plato's heaven is so hospitable. Um, no, I mean, I, I hear myself right now as producing tokens and I hear you as producing tokens that have spatial temporal location. I'm wrong about that, but it's, a, you know, it's an illusion. It's part of what I take myself to be hearing is, and producing is, are things that have spatial temporal properties. Okay, thanks. Unlike abstractum. Yep. We still have a few minutes left. Um, if you have more questions for George, uh, raise your hands with time. Oh, come on. Other people must have been offended. <laughs> John. John. Yeah, just a quick point about this idea of. Um, approximating. <clears throat> I'm not sure if that's true. I mean, so take something like a triangle. Um, so, you, you know, you have some image there. And I take it the problem uh, with, as it were, perfect triangles <clears throat> is that, you know, the line, a line has no thickness and the angles, therefore I'm going to internal angles and go to some to 180 degrees etc um so it's not so much about anything out there which you would recognize as a triangle approximate a triangle isn't it something like it's closer to well <laughs> you you see it as a triangle as opposed to any other thing yeah, yeah. Look, I agree with you, and I, I, I thought about adding that, you know, you know, you know in a long footnote. Um, sure, I mean, our recognition of triangles, I mean, you know, just take the say with that example, of course, it's heavily context dependent. And we mean, well, this is more like a triangle than that other thing he drew on the blackboard. And so I think yeah. he intended to write, you know, do a triangle there. And so I take it, you standardly, it does approximate that we usually three side ish <laughs> right just to be saying i mean yeah but you have to be generous with approximate and we are generous in, in our normal perceptual and conversational practices okay so that people can draw very weird things on the blackboard and go, which will count as triangles so i take your point uh uh and uh, uh i quote in my book i quote uh, 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 a number of people uh, uh chomsky and halley and also uh, lids and galliari and quite a few other people who talk this way about probabilistic estimates of um, you know, what SREs have been produced. Okay. Uh, and I, I, I defer to them for the full details about how probably complicated that is. Mm -hmm. Okay. But good. Yeah, it's a good issue. A good issue to think about. Everybody's convinced? Thank <laughs> you.
Well, so David, maybe maybe that's it for today. Yes, uh, let's thank our speaker today. Thank you very much, George. Um, My pleasure. My pleasure. And thanks for your good questions. Lovely discussion.